Dear TCRCC family, Worship over the past few weeks has been both fun and refreshing. We have enjoyed getting together to prepare worship music while following proper social distancing guidelines to protect ourselves and those we love. While we did that well, we unfortunately misunderstood the details regarding church services and volunteer-driven labor as social religious gatherings and mistakenly had practice ahead of the scheduled phase. Thankfully, everyone seems to be fine so far. Once our church's county reaches phase two of the Safe Start plan, we will resume recording in person and in full vigor at a max of five participants at once. While this saddens us, our spirits are fired up as we pursue remote recording options like what you will experience today. Soon enough, we should see plenty of familiar faces over the next few weeks as we incorporate these new methods of doing worship music. Please bear with us today, as the customary video recording has been substituted for lyrics. But crank it up, listen, and chime in together. May God richly bless you until we can see one another again in person.
So I let my words be few. Jesus, I am so in love with you. I want to feel what you feel 
I want to see what you see, oh Lord, Lord, I, I want to love like you, I want to feel what you feel, I want to see what you see, oh, I'm not in a hurry when it comes to your spirit, when it comes to your presence, when it comes to your voice. Learning to listen, just to rest in your nearness. I'm starting to notice you are speaking. Who you're at. May we see like you see, Jesus. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Let's pray. Father God, we believe wholeheartedly that we are your people and you are our God. We believe, Almighty God, that you call each of us to pray and that you are eager to listen. We come to you with glad and sincere hearts, praising you and enjoying the grace and mercy you have granted each of us. We want desperately to honor you over and above all things great and small. But daily we fall short of honoring you the way we should in our thoughts, words, and actions. Forgive us, gracious Lord, for letting things get in the way of our complete devotion to you. Forgive us for giving more attention to distractions than to you and your word. Please forgive us for not simply falling completely silent before you and bending our ears towards you. We are profoundly grateful for your favor and the many blessings you bestow upon us. We are thankful for your wisdom and protection during this questionable time. Your word says that you do not let the righteous go hungry. Thank you for sustaining us and keeping us mindful of the hope we have in you, for raising our spirits when we focus on your promises. Continually remind us to pray about this COVID-19 pandemic around the world. For the sick, the vulnerable, and the infected, God heal them, protect them, and contain the spread of infection and disease. For the young and the strong, God, grant us sound judgment to practice the necessary safeguards to keep us from unwittingly spreading the coronavirus. For our local, state, and federal, and international governments and the scientific community, God, help our officials and scientists as they navigate and allocate the necessary resources for combating this pandemic that we are all experiencing to one degree or another. God, give them knowledge, wisdom, and the right voice. For the media committed to providing up-to-date information, God, help them to communicate the truth with an appropriate level of significance. For consumers of media looking to be well-informed, God, aid us in finding the most helpful information that will equip us to be good stewards and neighbors. Keep us from anxiety and panic and enable us to implement the recommended strategies, even if it means personal sacrifice. For the homeless and those with mental health challenges who feel isolated, and anxious and helpless, God provide them with encouraging and necessary support. And please, Father, stop the barrage of misbehavior of those capitalizing on our current circumstances. For missionaries in foreign countries and international travelers, God, provide them with words of hope and equip them to love and serve those around them. 
Father God, help those who need to return home with your perfect timing and safety. For workers in a variety of industries who have been laid off and are facing financial hardship, God, help them to find their rest, trust, and hope in you. Grant wisdom to your church and inspire us to give to anyone who has need and generously support them. For families with children at home, God, help parents to creatively extend care that will nourish and flourish their children. And for the parents who are able to work outside the home, God, present them with safe solutions for the care of their children and thank you for your provisions. On this Memorial Day weekend, we pray for those who have courageously laid down their lives for the cause of freedom. May the examples of surrender and sacrifice inspire us. Bless the families that are affected by the loss of loved ones. Fill their homes and their lives with your strength and your enduring peace. May we be particularly mindful of the selfless love and sacrifice of your own son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for each and every one of us. Holy God, use today's message to impact our hearts and minds to hunger and thirst after you and your righteousness. Satisfy our cravings with you and you alone. May we walk away restored and ready for action. And in the words of Hebrews 12, 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. May we always marvel at the wonders of Christ and his saving grace. In Jesus' name, amen. We have just a few announcements this morning. If you need or want to ask for prayer, please send an email to prayer at tacomacrc.org. I wish to acknowledge each of our staff members, Pastor Clay, Pastor Nick, Jay, Kristen, and Melissa, who have continuously and diligently worked toward caring for our church and its people during this unique time. If you need to reach out to any one of them, please send an email to staff at TacomaCRC.org. Also, if you have a need that you cannot meet on your own, please reach out to your district elder or deacon. You will find their contact information in the bulletin online or in your email attachments from the church. I wish to thank them for conscientiously leading and serving our congregation throughout the, these rare months. Next, may the word of our Lord, spoken through his servant, Pastor Clay, bless you. Have a great day. Good morning. Tomorrow is Memorial Day. It's a day that we are supposed to remember those who have passed on, those who dedicated their lives and sometimes sacrificed their lives for the protection of our country. It's a day to set aside for remembrance. And to do that's a good thing. To remember is a good thing. It helps us to not take those sacrifices for granted. It gives honor to those who were willing to make those sacrifices. And it gives us an opportunity to pray, to thank God for their service. Last week, I asked you to consider fasting one day a week. And dur during this six week uh, series that we're beginning called Hungry, and a few of you shared with me some of your struggles that you're having with that concept. And so I want to clarify a few things. As I said last week, this is not a command as if I even 
have the right to command you to do anything. Nor is it even an expectation, hidden or otherwise. It's simply an invitation. A fast should never be about something that you do legalistically or begrudgingly. Like generous giving, a fast is a, is a sacrifice of praise, and we are to give our sacrifices of praise with a joyful heart. A fast, in some ways, serves the same purpose as Memorial Day. Well, except that Memorial Day is an excuse to barbecue. But it, a fast does remind us not to take for granted the one who sacrificed his life so that we could have life. A fast makes us hungry physically, but as it makes us hungry physically, it also serves the purpose of making us hungry spiritually for the one who can truly satisfy our hunger. So don't make it into something that is legalistic. So if you're feeling led by God to fast, then do it and do it for the right reason. And if not, then don't. A fast is always between you and God. And secondly, I also recognize that some of you have medical conditions that prevent you from fasting from food. And so you may want to consider fasting from something else. One dear friend of mine from the church, whom I met um, over 22 years ago, even before I started coming to this church and who I have a great deal of respect for, she expressed that for her, this quarantine itself has served somewhat as a reminder to her to draw near to God, to hunger and thirst for God. So in some ways, this has already been her fast. So whether you are fasting from food or for, from something else, allow it to be a reminder that we are to hunger and thirst for righteousness. That is the key verse of this entire series. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled, Matthew 5, 6. And as I stated last week, righteousness means to be in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. We receive this right relationship through grace, by grace through faith. But we are also to hunger for more of that grace. We're to constantly be desiring more of Christ. And today we're going to begin to describe one of the things that Scripture indicates that we should hunger for as we desire to know God and as we desire to be more like Jesus. That is, that we are to hunger for the sacred. Much of what I'm going to address today comes from the second chapter of Francis Chan's book, Letters to the Church. And I've read this book, this chapter, probably three times. But each time that I've read it, again, it has instilled in me a fresh hunger for the sacred. Many of us have heard someone uh, lament over the moral condition of our country, saying nothing is sacred anymore. And typically that indicates that the person, it, it shows their sadness, that, that things that were important to them, things that were important that they saw as values, that the country saw as values, were no longer valued by the majority of the people. There's this loss, this grief that we feel when the things we consider sacred are stripped away. Because in some ways, the sacred provides us with a sense of order. It helps alleviate our fear of the chaos because it, it tells us that there are just some lines that should never be crossed. There are some things that are so holy that we don't dare dishonor them. So when you remove the sacred, your foundation becomes shaky. And if ever there was a place or a people who should hunger for the sacred, 
you would think it would be the church. However, even within the church, I think sometimes we have treated the sacred carelessly or have even disregarded it. We should reverently, with caution, enter into the sacred. I want to share five areas that we should be hungering for as we hunger for the sacred. And it all begins with hungering for a sacred God. What are the first five words of the Bible? In the beginning, God created. In the Hebrew, it's actually only three words. And I won't butcher the language by trying to pronounce the Hebrew words, but it means first created God. And in the scripture, that word first and the word for end are so often used in conjunction with one another that when you hear the word first, you actually anticipate the word end. And the point is that God is from the beginning and will be till the end. He always has been and he always will be. It's what we read in Revelation 21, 6, where John uh, is speaking about the one who is seated on the throne. And he says, he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Do we hunger and thirst for a sacred God? One who, is, who infinitely exists, one who is infinitely holy, one who is infinitely loving and infinitely just, one who is infinitely powerful and infinitely good, one who is infinitely right. And do we look at ourselves in light of that infinitely sacred God? My knees tremble and my heart pounds and my pride melts when I catch even the slightest glimpse of the sacredness of God. I want to know that God. I want to know him more. And yet I, along with pretty much every other human being except for Jesus Christ himself, fail to remember the sacredness of God. If I always remembered, I wouldn't rush carelessly into the sacred. Let me ask you a question. When you read the story of 2 Samuel 6, of Uzzah reaching out to grab a hold of the Ark of the Covenant to prevent it from falling to the ground, and when you read that he was struck dead for doing so, how many of you said, really, God? Really? Is this fair? He was just trying to keep it from falling. Or how about Moses? being forbidden to enter into the promised land because he struck the, walk, the rock with his staff to bring water out of it rather than speaking to it. Is that really fair? Should the promised land have been taken away from him? Or how about Ananias and Sapphira who were struck dead because they lied about how much money they gave to the church and how much they kept for themselves? Don't we often relate to Job when things stink and God seems silent as to why? Don't we, along with Job, want to say, God, what are you doing? This just isn't right. Haven't we felt that? It isn't right when a loved one is suffering from cancer. It isn't right when a child is born with a deformity. It isn't right that we're going to be stuck in this stupid quarantine for a quarter of a year. Those feelings are absolutely normal. And they're understandable. 
but they're also indicative that we have forgotten the sacredness of God. God's response to Job is the same response he has for us. He says, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. That would have been enough to put me on my heels to hear God say this to me, but he didn't stop there. Verse after verse, God continues to remind Job that he and he alone is infinitely sacred. Does that mean that God doesn't care about our pain? Not in the least. He hears our prayers and is moved from heaven to act upon our behalf. He sent his only begotten son into the world to face shame, to face torture, to die on our behalf, to take the full weight of sin upon himself and all of the wrath that accompanies it. So don't think for a moment that God lacks compassion. But also, don't lose for a moment the awe and wonder of his sacredness. We are not God's judge. He is too sacred, and we are too limited to be his judge. So hunger to know in a deeper way the sacredness of God. And having acknowledged the sacredness of God and, and having submitted to that, next we hunger for a sacred story. Have you ever stopped to think about the fact that you are a part of an eternal plan? And that you were a part of that plan long before you were ever even conceived. Before you were even a thought in your parents' mind, you were a part of an essential, an essential part of God's story. Before the universe and the world was created, before God formed those, he had written you into the pages of his sacred will. And yes, I am aware of the double message of that last statement I just made. He has written you into his will, meaning his eternal plan for you. And he has written you into his will, meaning his eternal inheritance. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. You are a part of God's redemptive plan. Just like the patriarchs, just like the prophets and the apostles and all of those that were written about in the word of God, your name has been written on every page of God's story. So the affirmation that God gave to Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 5, he also gives to us. He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So what has God appointed you for? And isn't what he has appointed you for just as sacred 
is what he has appointed Jeremiah for. The Apostle Paul says, For we are God's handiwork, his creation, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So when you go to work, and you put up with all the stresses and you come home exhausted and you do it to provide for your household. Or if you're staying at home and you're working in the household and the kids are running around screaming and you don't know exactly how you're going to do this job. What you're doing is sacred. When you pick up that phone and you call the widow or the widower, that is a sacred phone call. When you discipline your children or stand up for the person who's being bullied or you, or you do your homework or you take out the garbage or pick up a piece of litter or care for your animals or snuggle with your baby, what you are doing is sacred. Particularly if it is being done to honor God and to serve others. In the church, handing out bulletins, greeting visitors, running projection, uh, teaching Sunday school, babysitting, or maybe during quarantine, sitting at home and taking time to talk with your family about what is being said that is sacred. Because that is a part of the story that God has ordained for you. I hope and I pray that you hunger to be a part of God's sacred story. And third, we are to hunger for a sacred temple. In preparing our Bible trivia countdown this week, I spent a lot of time rereading about the preparation for the tabernacle and for the temple. And I was reading in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 where Solomon has just finished building the temple. He's put out all the offerings and he has prayed a prayer of dedication over it. And in verse 1 through verse 4, we read this. It says, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and they gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is good. His love endures forever. And as I read that, I, I was thinking, wouldn't it have been amazing to have been there and to see that fire coming down, to see the glory of God resting on the temple. I think I would have been on my face too. It's overwhelming to think about the glory of God resting on his temple. And I got to tell you that a part of me is a little jealous. Well, that is until I read the second chapter of Acts. Because in the second chapter of Acts, there too, God's glory comes down as tongues of fire and rests upon his temple. Not Herod's temple, his new temple, the disciples of Jesus Christ. We can't miss this. This is crucial to our understanding. Of the, of, the, of the sacred. Francis Chan says, the fact that I covet the Old Testament experience is an indication that I don't appreciate the new reality I should. The new reality that he's talking about is revealed to us by Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. It says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building 
is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you are the new temple in which all of God's glory comes to dwell. Which means that you are sacred, not divine, no more than the sacred mountain upon which Jesus was transfigured was divine. No more than the sacred utensils used on the altar of sacrifice were divine. But like them, you are set apart, consecrated, and holy unto the Lord. And that means that your brothers and sisters in Christ are also sacred. So if we are sacred, why do we tear ourselves down? Why do we let the words of others tear us down? Why do we gossip and spread rumors? I'm amazed how many times in the scriptures God, through the, the work of Holy Spirit, through those writers, how many times he condemns gossip. Why is that? Because it tears down the sacred. Again, Francis Chan tells us that every time we speak evil against our brother and sister, it's like taking a sledgehammer and using it to smash the walls of the temple. We're destroying the sacred. And therefore, the words of 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17 should resound in us like a lahar warning. They say, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Do you hunger for the sacred? Do you honor the temple? The last part of that same verse actually leads to the fourth point, which is that we are to hunger for a sacred assembly. The verse we just read at the end of it, it says, you together are the temple. And in the Greek, it's actually just one word, but it is the plural form of the word you. And so the NIV rightly translates it as being, it carries that nuance of you together are that temple. It's not just you individually. You individually aren't the temple. You together are the, the temple. Together we are connected and joined with one another and connected and joined with Christ to make up this temple. To me, an even more powerful illustration is found in Ephesians 5, 29 through 30, which says, after all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. We are members of his body. I want you to let that concept sink in Together we share in the body of Christ. We are a part of him, and he is a part of us through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And each one of us is endowed with gifts from the Holy Spirit so that together we may build up the body of Christ. And I hope that that leaves you in awe of the church. Because if it doesn't, you are missing a truth that amazed even the angels. In 1 Peter 1, 12, it tells us that the angels looked at the gospel story. They looked at the plan of salvation that God would call out his church. And they hungered to look into it. Do you? I pray that we reject the lie 
that our faith is just between us and God. You've heard it, and I've heard it, and maybe some of us have even bought into it. It is this logic that says, you know, I can go up into the mountains and worship God through the beauty of his creation. And the thing is, that's true. But you miss the point. You can worship God anywhere, but you alone are not the church. We as a body of Christ are the church, and the church is more sacred than even the grandest and the most beautiful of all of God's creation. The church is the bride of Christ adorned in beauty and splendor. You know, I thank God for what we're able to do here today. And I thank God that we are able to reach out to people who don't live around here and, and who can't come to our assembly. But people, I need you to know this is temporary. Not the online thing, because I'm hoping that we'll be able to continue to provide an online aspect, but us being separated, that's temporary. We will gather. We will assemble. When it is right, we will come together again. And if there is one thing that I would hope that would come out of this pandemic, it would be for us to hunger for a sacred assembly, that we would hunger for the church. And finally, we are to hunger for sacred worship. Did you know that not all acts of worship are sacred worship? Did you know that there is a worship that God hates? It's spoken of in many places in the scriptures, but one of the clearest is where God is speaking through the prophet Amos when he says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. And I pray that God has never hated my worship. But I suspect that there have been times that he has. Because what I have brought before him were lame offerings. They were lazy, blemished sacrifices. They were the acts of going through the motions without realizing the sanctity of the moment. We talked about the sacredness of the assembly. But if we're only gathering to fulfill our duty, if we are only gathering because it makes us look good and makes us feel pious, if we are only gathering so that we can enjoy our friends, then our worship is defiled. The problem in Amos is that they're doing the right things, but from the wrong heart. They were giving God second best, and even worse, they weren't letting their encounter of worship to change their lives. They were depriving people of justice. They were living unrighteous lives, and somehow they felt that if they just walked through the motions, God would accept it. Well, you saw God's response. Worship is sacred, and we cannot enter into it haphazardly or lazily or even worse, hypocritically. And I suspect that many of us 
have offered at times in our life defiled worship. I mean, after all, how can we as broken people, how can we give God anything that is pure? I'll tell you how. We take a lesson from David. Broken, he comes before God and he says, you do not delight in sacrifices or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. He says that in Psalm 51, verses 16 through 17. True contrition is one of the purest forms of worship that there is. To offer yourself broken, repentant, throwing yourself upon the mercy and grace of God is the purest form of worship there is. Drinking deeply of his grace, his rich, abundant grace. That's about as sacred as it gets. Do you hunger for true, pure worship? Does it impact the way that you think about God? The way that you honor God? Does it impact the way that you obey God? Does it change the makeup of who you are and what you do? Or has it become just another thing you do? Like being satisfied with rice cakes when God's offering us T-bones. Are you hungry? For worship. I have some homework for you. This is my challenge to you today. I want you to go read Revelation chapters 4 and 5. And I'm not going to take the time to read them here because frankly I'm out of time. But besides that, I want you to engage these chapters. Let the description that you read about wash over you. Let those descriptions capture your imagination. Let them lift your eyes to the glory of the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, and see if the Holy Spirit moves your heart. I don't know how we look into the glory of God and then go through the motions. I don't know how we can look into the sacred and treat it as if it's commonplace. When we begin to taste the sacred, we hunger for it even more. So eat well. Let's pray. God, may you stir within us a hunger for the sacred. May we look into your glory, into your infinite sacredness, and be overwhelmed by it. May we recognize that you have written us into your story. May we honor the temple. May we recognize that your Holy Spirit lives within us and within our brothers and sisters. May we hunger for a gathering together for a sacred assembly and may we worship you with pure hearts as we seek your face we pray in jesus name amen and now at this time receive a blessing from the lord today as you go throughout whatever it is you're going to do today may you be in awe of the sacred. May you be overcome by the love of God our Father and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God from